21st Sunday after Pentecost, and uh, we'll be here again at St. Mary's. In the epistle for this 21st Sunday after Pentecost, Sagum St. Paul's at Ephesians, chapter 6. Brethren, be strengthened in the Lord and in the might of his power. Put you on the armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the deceits of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and to stand in all things perfect. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of justice, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in all things taking the shield of faith, wherewith you may be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the most wicked one, and take unto you the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the sword of God. And then the Gospel. Say that according to St. Matthew chapter 18. At that time Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a king who would take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to take the account, one was brought to him that owed him 10,000 talents. And as he had not wherewith to pay it, his Lord commanded that he should not be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. But that servant falling down besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant, being moved with pity, let him go, and forgave him the debt. But when that servant was gone out, he found one of his fellow servants that owed him a hundred pence. And laying hold of him, he, he, he throttled him, saying, Pay what thou owest. And his fellow servants falling down besought him, saying, Have patience to me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went on cast him into prison, till he paid the debt. Now his fellow servants, seeing what was done, were very much aggrieved. And they came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord called him and, and came and saith to him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt, because thou besoughtest me. Shouldst not thou then have, have um, had compassion also on thy fellow servant, even as I had compassion on thee? And the Lord, being angry, delivered him to the torturers until he paid all the debt. So also shall my heavenly Father do to you, if you forgive not every one his brother from his heart, from your hearts. Those were the words of today's holy gospel. So today, a few considerations. We know that on the will of God. We know that in the, that everything that happens truly is said to be the will of God or allowed by God. But we have an example in the sacred scripture today of the, the battle of the day of the death of Judas Maccabeus. And on the day that he died, there were 20,000 soldiers of the enemies of God. 20,000 of them. And he had 3,000 soldiers. And it was towards the evening, and he saw the 20,000 come, and the 3,000 saw the 20,000 come, and they saw the great army of Nicanor come, and Judas was ready to fight them and defeat them. But during the night, 2,200 of his soldiers escaped because they were afraid to fight Nicanor. And when the morning came and they saw them, his army slip away from the middle of the night, he had only 800 soldiers who stayed with him. And Judas said to those 800 soldiers, they said to him, Lord, we are ready to fight. But we had 3,000 soldiers last night. We have only 800 now. Perhaps it's wiser for us to go back, to flee from the face of the enemy, gather together our troops and fight. And Judas said to his soldiers, says, No, this is not wise. For we cannot stain our glory by fleeing from the face of the enemy. For we never flee from his face let not our glory be stained. And it says Judas was greatly discouraged before he said these words because he saw his soldiers 
those 3,000 soldiers, he saw them slip away in the night. But he took the 800 and he said, let us fight manfully, and this be our day to die, let us die manfully, and our glory shall last to the end of the world. And they went and fought. And they fought from morning until night, 800 soldiers against 20,000. And during the middle of the great battle, they saw the strongest and bravest of the soldiers of Nicanor were on the right wing. And therefore Judas attacked to destroy those 800. And as he had those, the strongest soldiers, and he went to attack the strongest soldiers, the ones on the left wing pulled in behind. And they went from behind and attacked Judas from behind, and they slew many of the soldiers of Judas, and some fled the battlefield, and Judas was slain. And a great sorrow went across Israel that Judas, Judas the hammer, Judas the Maccabee, had died in battle. Now it was the will of God that he died in battle. But let's reconsider that day from another perspective. We often say, that this defeat was allowed and willed by God. So it's like the battle of the Spanish Armada that went to fight against the English in order to save England, to make England Catholic, to keep England Catholic in 1588. And the winds blew against the sea, against the ships of the Spanish, and they were defeated and wiped out by the English. And the Spanish lost. And because of that defeat, England became and remained Protestant and did not return back to the Catholic faith. And when the word came to, 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 to uh, Philip II, and he saw the nature of the battle, that his whole Spanish armada, it was a transition from the great glory of Spain ruling the seas to the glory of England ruling the seas. And it was a transition from the, the Spain being able to save England from the Catholic faith, and England being defeated, and, and, and being victorious, and spreading Protestantism throughout the world. And when the word came to Philip II that his navy was wiped out, those who were not wiped out in the, in, in the battle <clears throat> were driven apart by the seas, and the, and the Spanish navy was never able to recover from that battle in 1588. And he had the Te Deum son, because it was clearly God who for some reason had willed that this defeat come, for some profound reason, because of the sins of men, because of the situation in the world of the church, he allowed that defeat. And there is a case where the winds blew against the Spanish. But what about the battle of, of, of Judas in the book of Maccabees? Judas was discouraged. And why was he discouraged? Because he had 3,000 men to fight against 20,000. And he knew that had he gone into the battle with 3,000 against 20,000, he would have defeated Nicanor. He would have wiped him out. There would have been a great victory for the Jews. And, the, and Israel would be saved. For those 3,000 men. But 2,200 of them were cowards. 2,200 were afraid of the fight. And therefore they left. And because they left, God allowed Judas to die. Judas would not have died that day. Judas would have continued as a, as a great leader of the army of the Jews, and he would have defeated and wiped out, like he had done before, many more times, the enemies of God. Why did God allow Judas to die? And those 800 men that were with him remained faithful. They died, those that did not run away from the battlefield. And they fought from morning to night against an army of 20,000, showing clearly that if the 3,000 were there, the victory was for the Jews. And what does this show us? Why is it that there is oftentimes a victory of Satan? There are sometimes the victories that seem to be out of our control, like the battle of the English-Spanish Armada. But there are other victories that are clearly 100% in the control of those that are the followers of God. Had those 2,200 men not been cowards, victory was the Jews. But because they were cowards, God allowed a defeat. And in order to explain the battle of Lepanto, we're going to visit that battle again on the day of the judgment. I mean the battle of, of the Spanish Armada. And we will discover that there was someone in that Spanish fleet, like the Jews, under Moses, who fought against the enemies of God. And they were defeated. And at the end of the battle, it was discovered that one Jew, one Jew had an idol that he did not throw away. He had an idol that he kept to worship 
And because of the sin of that one Jew, the entire army was defeated. So why is it that we experience defeat against the enemies of God? Why is it that sometimes the modernists win, and sometimes the enemy armies win? And why is it that they win? It is because of the cowardice and because of the sins of the followers of Christ. On the Day of Judgment, we'll revisit that battle in 1588 when the English won. And why did they win? Because of the sins of the Catholics. Even though those men of that battle may have been brave, there were too many sins amongst the followers of God. They were too far away from God. They were too given into the modern world. They were too much immersed in the modern apostasy, which began 500 years ago. They were within 100 years of the beginning of the great apostasy. And they were too much into it, and therefore they didn't have the muscles they had before. They couldn't swing the sword that they could before. They didn't have the control of the seas that they had before. Because the faith had diminished in them, and therefore the English defeated them. And so likewise, on this day of the book of Maccabees, all the people wept. If only we had Judas, the, the, the hammer. If only Judas Maccabeus was still alive. If only he was still with us. We would be able to defeat the enemies of God. And they wept and they mourned. But these tears did not climb to heaven. And why is this? Because the death of Judas was not because of Nicanor. The death of Judas was not because of 20,000 soldiers. The death of Judas was because of through 2,200 cowards. And these 2,200 cowards, they ran away in the night. And these 2,200 cowards changed history. And we can say that well, the Jews would have had a much greater glory. Instead of in glory, after the time of the Maccabees being wiped out, with John Hyrcanus being the brief reign of glory, they could have had that reign of glory under Judas Maccabees, under a much holier and greater king under a much holier and greater priest, because he was both a priest and a soldier. And Judas, and the hammer, and the priest and soldier, would have brought the Jews to great glory, and he was ready to bring them to great glory. He was willed by God to bring them to great glory, but God does not take away the free will of men, including the free will of his own soldiers. How many times is the Catholic Church defeated because of cowards? Cowards make choices. We make choices. What is it that caused the, uh, Herod to be able to mock Christ? What is it that caused the, uh, the, the scourging of Christ, the crowning of thorns with Christ? It was the cowardice of Pilate. If he was strong, it wouldn't have happened. If he was strong and evil, Christ would have been crucified before noon. If he was strong in wickedness, if he was strong in good, he would have saved Christ. And, led, and took him away from the crowd. But he was not strong. He was weak. He was a coward. He was not brave and evil. He was not brave and good. Did his wimpiness, did his lack of ability to make a decision, did it affect Christ? And how much did it affect him? Hence we say until the end of the world that our Lord Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. Not under Caiaphas. Not under Annas. Not under Herod, but under Pontius Pilate. He is the one. Because the decision of the coward is an important decision in what happens in the history of the world. Why is it that when they brought in the Novus Ordo into the parishes, everywhere in the world, we have the report everywhere. In every country, we have the same report. The people did not like it. In every diocese, we have the same report. The priests did not like it. There were 6,000 priests in Spain alone. 6,000 priests signed a letter. And these 6,000 priests sent this letter to Pope Paul VI in 1967 or 1968. We have heard about this new rite of mass that you want to push upon us next year. We Spanish priests will not accept it. We don't want this new mass. We refuse this new mass they're going to put upon us next year. And we want you to know that we are 6,000 strong. We all signed our names. Why is it that when you sign your name on a petition, they throw it in the wastebasket? Because if they threw it in the fire, it might go out. Paper is good for kindling. You don't lie. But if you take that paper with the wet, worthless names of 6,000 wimps, 
It's no good for the fire. Throw it in the wastebasket. Flush it down the toilet. But 6,000 priests signed the petition. 6,000 priests signed it. In 1969, the new mass came to Spain. 6,000 priests said the new mass. There was none of them, zero, that stood up. Now, 3,000 soldiers went to be brave and fight with Judas the hammer. They had heard of his great exploits. He had already won so many great victories. He was so strong and so brave and such a great leader, and they knew that this was the great warrior, and they had the privilege of being in his army, and the 3,000 charged, and they were ready to be in his army, and they talked about defeating all the bad guys, and then the evening time was a nice bright evening. They saw 20,000 soldiers, and they saw horsemen, and they saw archers, and they saw armor, and they decided they had something better to do in the night. They escaped in the night. How many souls escape in the night? Souls throughout the entire world escape in the night. Everywhere they escape in the night. And then they wonder, why did my parish turn bad? Why did my diocese turn bad? Why did the church turn bad? I'm standing behind a brave priest. I'm standing behind, we're all together. We got our sacred resistance table. We sit in the corner of the parish hall with sound, with a cone of silence coming over our heads. We sit in the parish hall with, with uh, all kinds of uh, uh, protection sound. But when we speak the secret code, Bishop Filet, Filet, bad, bad, bad. So they use the secret code. But they do not speak with the priest. They do not speak with the fellow faithful. They do not openly communicate the faith. And what would happen if they did? What would happen if they did? If they did, there would not be dead heroes. The heroes would be alive. Instead, the heroes die. Instead, they are, they are wiped out. But if the men stand behind the heroes, or behind the leaders, and if they fight, and they don't turn in flight, then the enemy is defeated. Though wherefore, we cannot say that Vatican II happened because it was allowed by God. Just like many people tried to say, well, Judas, in order for Christ to be crucified, there had to be a Judas. So therefore, Christ went around, I'll take 11 good men, and we pick a traitor. He didn't pick a traitor. He picked 12 good men. He picked 12 men that he loved. He took 12 men that would be great apostles. 12 men that would be great saints. 12 men that would be pillars of his church. 11 were cowards. And he had to heal their cowardice. And one was a traitor. And he did not repent. But he chose 12 men who could, would not be cowards. But 11 became cowards anyway. He chose 12 men that would be pillars. And even if they were to fall, would repent. But one would not repent at all. He chose wisely. But he did not take away our, holy free, our free will. He did not force us to stay in the army. They joined the army of Judas the Hammer, the greatest of all the warriors. And one of the greatest warriors of all time. To be in his army. To fight with those 3,000 against 20,000. These 20,000 would have been wiped out. It would have been a complete massacre. He still almost won with only 800. So did 3,000? What if 1,000 were cowards? What if 2,000 were cowards? And there were 1,000 that stayed strong instead of 800. They almost won the battle. They fought from morning until night. They drove behind, the, they drove the enemy, and how were they defeated? They were defeated from the back. And why were they defeated from the back? Because the weak soldiers, who were not so strong to be in the front, they could have at least defended the rear guard. They could have at least held up, some, some, held up the attack of the enemy from behind. They could have held them back long enough for Judas to wipe out the great leaders of the enemies of God. And then the enemies would flee the battlefields. So we're in a fight in which this devil has spread himself throughout the entire world, in which the church has turned more and more against God, in which souls are wandering away at the least breath. It used to take a great wind to knock someone over. Now the rumor of a breeze and the, and the breeze on a Bose sound system 
and the, and, and the picture of a breeze on, on, a, on a TV or the picture of a fire on a TV causes us to burn and the picture of a breeze causes us to fall over. We don't even need the breeze anymore. The souls collapse too easy. They collapse too light. They cannot hold their faith. They cannot live according to the law of God. How many priests are not saying mass right now because a Catholic mother in 1972 decided to abort her baby, though she would perhaps repent later. How many souls are in hell right now? Because we decided not to stand for the truth. We wanted to stand for the truth, but they were embarrassed. They wanted to do the right thing, but they were afraid. They wanted to stand behind the Archbishop Lefebvre. They wanted to stand behind the truth. Imagine if Cardinal Taviani, if he had done his duty, he was almost blind, more blind than he realized. He saw the truth, but he did not stand for it. He got his name attached to the Ottaviani Intervention. Sounds impressive, intervention. Ottaviani, cardinal, important document. What did that document do? It was given to Pope Paul VI. This new Mass departs from the Catholic theology of the Mass in whole as well as in detail. The greatest theologians, one of which is Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, helped put together this document to show very clearly that everyone would understand in black and white. And the Pope could read it himself. And surely when Pope Paul VI reads this at Octavian Intervention, and surely when he understands that this new rite of Mass is not Catholic, he's going to stop the new rite of Mass. It won't happen next year. It won't happen. And then it happened. And Ottaviani and all the good priests could say, we did our part. We wrote a document. We signed a petition. We made it clear that we don't like it. We let it be known what we think of our superiors. <coughs> but in battle, it is not a time of thinking. It's a time of pulling out swords. It is not a time of speaking. And letting the superiors know. When you let Satan know that he did something wrong, you're giving him useless information. He's Satan. He doesn't do things unless they're wrong. Therefore, it's not important to let Satan know he's doing something wrong. This was a mistake of Eve way back in the very beginning. She had infused knowledge, and she was filled with grace. But she wanted to make Satan know he was doing something wrong. She wanted to make Satan know that she's not right to do something against God. She wanted to let Satan be informed. And so she informed Satan of the truth. She informed Satan of the law of God. She tried to convert Satan. And what happened? She ate the forbidden fruit. Remember, she had infused knowledge. More intelligent than any human being that came after her, except for the Blessed Virgin Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ. And she had confused grace, and she had no original sin, and she was filled with perfect holiness. It was not enough to convert the devil. So if Eve cannot convert the devil who is infused with all virtue, who has no original sin, who is perfect before God, if she can't convert the devil, neither can we. Therefore, we should not strive so hard to convert the devil. So the new mass comes. And the priests of the church don't like it. They say they don't like it. But how do they say it? In the manner of whispers. They say it in the manner of whispers. And here's the trouble of whispers. Who rules the word of whisp world of whispers? It is Satan that rules that world. And so we go and whisper and say, we're against the new mass. And they whisper and say, if you say something, you're going to die. Which whisper wins? For the follower of God speaks not in whispers. What did Judas do in the battle? 800 soldiers against 20,000. Rule number 14 of the Ignatian exercises the first week. How does the devil fight? He fights like a military commander when he's besieging a city. And what does the military commander do when he's besieging a city? He looks for the weakest point. And he attacks at the weakest point. This is the tactic of Satan. Look for the weakest point and attack the weakest link. This is what Satan does. He saw Adam in his infused virtue and infused grace. 
He saw Eve, infused virtue and infused grace. He saw that she is the weaker sex. Therefore, he attacked her. For what purpose? To get Adam. This is the tactic of Satan. Now, oftentimes, we followers of Christ, we want to use the same tactic. Let us attack the enemy at his weakest point. Let us fight as Satan fights. The trouble with fighting with Satan's methods is that Satan wins when we fight with Satan's methods. He looks for the weakest point. 800 soldiers of Judas Maccabeus fighting 20,000. The wise general will say, let's take out the easy guys first. Let's take out the weak side first. And let's let them see how we've killed so many of them and let them run away. That's not what Judas did. He said, where is the strongest and where are the bravest of the soldiers of Nicanor? Where are they? They're on the right side. And therefore, he assaulted the right side. He went straight for the bravest. He went straight for the strongest. And what did his brother do? St. Amber, St. Gregory, continue the sermon of last week. St. Gregory, St. Gregory continues it as well in his sermon that's written in the breviary. Look at Simeon. Simeon, the brother of Judas, all of the Jews fled the battlefield, and he and one other man fought alone, two of them. And they gathered together their soldiers again, and they won the war, and they won the battle, too. Judas followed 800 and ended up being defeated. Now, what, Judas, what happened with Simeon, he gathered, he had two soldiers, whereas Judas had 800. But Simeon was able to gather together the cowards, the ones that had fled the battlefield, and they came back. And when the cowards came back to the battlefield, Simeon won. Judas fought with 800 brave soldiers, and the cowards, none of them came back. And therefore, he was defeated. And it was a great morning, day of mourning for the Jews. But why did the Jews, why should the Jews mourn? Not because of Nicanor. Not because of Antiochus, not because of the enemies of God. They should mourn because of 2,200 cowards. What if there were 2,100 cowards? He might have won. If there were 2,000 cowards, he might have won. If they were none of them cowards, he certainly would have won. And so we are in a fight right now. The cowards, that is those who have the truth, those who say they love it, those who say they want to follow it, but they're going to be safe. They're going to be prudent. They're going to be wise. They're going to wait for a better day. How many souls are damned because of the prudent and the wise? So many souls are damned because of the prudent and the wise. Hence it will be said in the day of judgment, yes, there are wicked uh, Rothschilds, and there are wicked Caiaphases, and there are wicked Annases, and there are wicked uh, all men of all types, Stalins and Hitlers and so on. There are wicked men all over the world. How much damage did these wicked men do? Put the souls that they have damned and put them on one side and you will see it as a small percentage. Now what about the cowards? What about the prudent? What about the wise? How many souls are they responsible for the damnation of? The number is legion. The number is legion. Compare the two. Nobody likes Stalin. He was limited in the evil that he could do. But what about the average guy? How many souls are damned? Because you aren't going to have another child because it's too inconvenient. You're going to practice Catholic birth control. Instead of aborting your children, which is kind of messy and a little bit expensive, you're going to make sure that you space your children by natural family planning. After all, that's a spiritual thing to do. You're going to use other methods by which it doesn't look so ugly the way you murder your children. What difference does it make? Cut the baby out, crush his head with a craniotomy, or don't let the baby be born. The result is the same. The baby is not born. The soldier is not in the battlefield. Choose your method. The ugly method of abortion or the clean method of NFP. How many souls are damned because a mother couldn't afford a baby? How many souls are damned because a good Catholic needed to space a baby? 
How many souls are damned? Because we're not going to stand up for the truth. Because we can't speak out against the priest when he preaches error. Because we can't go and speak openly to the padre, openly to the superiors, about the errors and evil that they are doing. How many souls are damned? Because of the 40 priests in the Society of St. Pius VI, the general chapter, now two of them, 2006, 12, and 2018, did not stand up. How many priests of those 40 priests believed that we should be modernists with Rome? How many of them believed that we should accept the doctrinal declaration, which was read to them in the 2012 general chapter, and they all accepted it? It was read aloud to them. They were not allowed to read it themselves, but it was read to them. And if they were given ears... As it recorded in the sacred scripture, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And faith comes by hearing, and so does the devil's lies. And so when they heard these wicked words being spoken by Bishop Fillet, reading it from his paper, in 2012, the priest of the general chapter, this is a declaration. I'm not going to let you read it yourself, but I'm going to read it to you. They had ears. They had ears. They did not stand up. Some were very upset. Some were very disturbed. But if one stood up, if one stood up and said, we're not accepting this modernist baloney, we will not accept this false doctrine, you will retract it. It would have been retracted. How many souls are damned? How many souls are away from God because of that? How many souls because the bishops did not stand up boldly at Vatican II? How many souls because the bishops did not stand after Vatican II, especially the conservative bishops, the good bishops, the prudent bishops, how many souls are damned because of the good priests and the prudent priests? And how many souls are damned because of the good faithful and the prudent faithful? They are the balanced conservative ones. They are the ones that want to make sure I really want better times to come, but I'm not going to stick my neck out. I really hope Judas wins the battle. But 3,000 against 20,000 is just not smart. Let's wait for a better day when we've got more reinforcements. It's just not smart. And those 3,000 would certainly have won the day. And who was responsible for the defeat? 2,200 cowards who wanted to join the army of Christ, who were brave enough to put on the uniform, brave enough to carry a sword, brave enough to go into battle. But when the fight came, they ran away. <laughs> And so this is our situation in the church today. How many souls are being damned because of the Luciferians? How many souls are being damned because of all the Satanists and the modernists and the liberals and the communists? We will discover the number is quite few. And how many souls are being damned because of the good, conservative, quote-unquote, traditional Catholic? The numbers are legion. We have to fulfill our duty according to our state of life. We have to have confidence in the grace and the power of God. We have to speak boldly the truth in the face of the wickedness of our modern world. And we must have confidence in the victory of Judas the Hammer. He will win. His victory comes. His glory continues to the end of the world. He is now a saint in heaven. And there must be a continuation of the fight. But he was discouraged and he wept. St. Thomas the Apostle on top of a mountain was discouraged and he wept. And St. Paul many times wept. And why did they weep? Because of the souls that could be heroes and they will die cowards. Because of the souls that could come to great victory and they will never achieve it. Even if the time comes that they barely sneak into heaven. Uh, they barely are allowed forgiveness of their sins and barely seek into heaven. They were meant to be warriors. They were meant to be great saints. They were meant to accomplish great things. But they did not accomplish them. They lived empty lives. And therefore, Thomas the Apostle, on top of a mountain in Kerala, wept. And therefore, Judas wept. And therefore, so many of the great saints wept. They did not weep because of the fear of the enemy. They did not weep because of the numbers of the enemy and because of the weapons of the enemy and because of the darts of the enemy. They wept because the friends were not brave, because the friends were not strong, because the friends did not persevere in the battle, because they were abandoned by their own friends. And that is why Judas died in battle with a sword in his back. Why did the sword go into his back? 
Why was he killed from behind? Because he was not protected by his own. He was not protected by those cowards who could have been there to defend him and he would have won the battle. And how many times God allows saints to die? All right, no more Archbishop Lefebvre, no more St. Bernard of Clairvaux, no more St. Augustine. All right, you have not followed their ways. No more Moses. When the great Moses died, he spoke to all the Jews and said, you are stiff-necked and you will turn against God. And God took Moses from them. And he gave them never again another Moses. You had one Moses. You will never have another. You will never, ever have another. And so it is with our holy church. Let there be more men, average men, who stand up. Average men that fulfill their duties. Average men that have a heart to spread the kingdom of Christ. Who are not afraid of the assaults and the darts of the enemies. This is what is needed to win our great battle. It is not determined by the darts and the numbers of the enemy. So therefore, let's pray for the men of their Catholic that they stand up and hold the truth, not send petitions, worthless letters, but rather change their ways, change their hearts, change their actions to follow Christ into battle. So I bless you all. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.